wondered what it's like to face the complex world of disability insurance claims as a physician? Meet Edward Dabdaub, the founding attorney at Dabdaub Law Firm. Eddie began his legal career working as a law clerk during law school at a disability insurance firm, and he would go on to build his own law firm for the sole purpose of handling disability insurance claims. He spent his entire legal career helping people get paid disability insurance benefits. Today, his firm represents all types of physicians across the country. Eddie specializes in physician disability insurance claims, appeals, and litigation. Eddie has represented many physicians and gained a deep understanding of the occupational duties, of various medical specialties, and he's applied that knowledge to successfully obtain disability insurance benefits on behalf of physicians. He recently won a case on behalf of a liver transplant surgeon who had own occupation disability insurance. After suffering a fall, the doctor could no longer perform liver transplant, but continued to perform other types of surgeries. His insurance company denied his total disability claim on the grounds that he had more than one occupation, because prior to his disability, he performed other types of surgeries when not doing liver transplants. Eddie successfully argued before the federal court that his occupation was that of a liver transplant surgeon. Once he became unable to perform liver transplant, he was totally disabled from his own occupation despite continuing to do other surgeries. With experience litigating in both federal and state courts, Edward Dabdaub is a true hero for those seeking the disability insurance benefits they deserve. So if you or someone you know is navigating the challenging world of disability insurance, don't miss the opportunity to connect with Edward Dabdaub and his dedicated team at Dabdaub Law Firm. They've got your back. Stay tuned for another fascinating episode of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. And remember, when life throws its toughest challenges your way, Edward Dabdaub and his firm are here to fight for your rights. Visit longtermdisability.net to learn more. If you become disabled and can't do all of your current job functions, who do you call first? Find out from this lawyer who helps physicians with their disability claims. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. On today's show, we have Edward Dabdaub. He was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica, and he's one of five attorneys in his immediate family. I can't imagine what family gatherings are like with that many attorneys in one place. Since becoming a lawyer, he's focused his law practice on representing people who are entitled to disability benefits from insurance companies. He represents clients at all stages of disability insurance claims. He's extensive knowledge of the of ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, since many of his clients' long-term disability cases are governed by that federal statute. He's participated as a guest speaker at law conferences, both on local and national stages, and he graduated cum laude from the University of Miami School of Law. And you'll find out in a moment why we're having Eddie Dabdab on the show. So Eddie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So first, how did you end up practicing in this very specific niche of the law? Well, I, you know, it's an interesting story. I didn't go to law school expecting to become a disability insurance attorney. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I was probably planning on going back to Jamaica and joining my father's practice. But I landed on uh, my first law job as a law clerk. I, re- I think I was in my second year of law school. And, and I did it to get extra income on the side and also experience practicing before graduating from law school. And it happened to be, I think, maybe one of only two or three disability insurance law firms in Florida. And I started working there in the summer and I kept working there through my third year in law school. And then when I graduated, they offered me a position and just slowly, I really started to enjoy the practice area. So I just kind of fell into it, frankly. Why is it that a physician might need someone like you? Yeah. So you're right. Physicians are this type of profession where I think maybe the same with you coming out of um, medical school and residency. Right, there are always the financial planners talking to everybody and offering disability insurance. It, it's probably the most heavily insured on the disability insurance side occupation in the country. And I think the short answer why they might need me is because disability insurance claims are 
complex, right? Physicians buy these insurance policies to ensure their occupation. And what your occupation is really depends on your medical specialty or the type of physician you are and how you go about practicing on a day-to-day basis. Your occupation is not for purposes of a disability insurance claim, what you wrote down on your insurance application. Instead, it's going to be the occupation as it had been performed by you just before you became disabled. So that really opens up a whole lot of questions about what is your occupation? How did you practice? Where is your income from the practice side coming from? And if you are still working in some capacity, are you truly totally disabled? Are you partially disabled? Are you not disabled at all? So there are, there, the devil is in the detail in a disability insurance claim. They're tedious. They can be drawn out and, and they're, they, they, they can get complex. So you really need an expert to handle it from the beginning. So sometimes these cases are cut and dry, but very often they're not. And that's why we need someone to advocate for us who understands the law who understands these contracts, because we can't just be expected to be able to fend for ourselves because sometimes we're getting pushback from the insurance company saying that, no, this is not what the contract says. Yeah, exactly. Right. Some cases, like you said, are pretty cut and dry. Someone, if a physician is in pretty bad shape and not practicing in any capacity, right? Maybe they had a surgical practice and they had the office side, the clinical side, and they're not doing any of it. And the insurance company agrees based on their own medical review or maybe an independent medical examination of the physician that he or she is medically unable to do the things they were doing before. That's straightforward. That claim is going to get approved. You probably don't need somebody like me. But most disability insurance claims aren't like that. Like all things in medicine, you're probably going to be able to look at it and and see both sides of a case like that. It's not cut and dry. It's going to boil down to, is the medical evidence there? Is it strong enough to establish you can't engage in the substantial and material duties of your own occupation the way you were performing it on a regular basis before you became disabled? Is the insurance company's doctors going to agree? Is the insurance company's vocational expert going to agree on your occupation and the way you performed it? Those are the ones that get complicated, and that's where I come in. Got it. But let's say you can get income from other ways, right? Let's say you can use your, like you're not practicing medicine the way you were practicing because let's say it's an injury to your hand or your back or, you know, some upper extremity so that you, you don't have the dexterity that you used to. You're not able to grip your stethoscope. But, you know, there are ways that you can, say, work for an insurance company or work in some other capacity where you're using your medical knowledge and experience to get income, but not necessarily anywhere close to what you were doing right before you got injured? It's going to depend on the specific language in your disability insurance policy. Back in the day when I started practicing, there were these insurance policies that were were really true own occupation, which means It was your inability to perform your occupation that was insured, even if you could go and work in something else. So I had clients who really reinvented their career in ways you've described, right? They went on to do file reviews, some went on to teaching, and they continued to collect a total disability insurance check because they're not working in their specific occupation anymore. More recently, what we've seen is insurance policies that are being issued as own occupation insurance policies. But when you read the language of those contracts closely, there is uh, a provision that says, but you are not engaged in another occupation. And so that's where you really need to look closely at the product that you're buying. Because if you want to insure your own occupation to allow yourself in the event that you become disabled to go on to do something else and not stay home all day watching reruns of Oprah, then you need to make sure that language that precludes you from doing any other type of work is not included in there. And, and, and sometimes, Brad, it's as simple as going back to the insurance company or the insurance broker and saying, hey, I saw a provision in here that says total disability also requires me not to be engaged in another occupation. Can we get a rider on my insurance policy that removes that language? That, that is possible with some insurance policies. And if you're a physician listening to this, that's hugely important. 
any other language that we should be looking for when we're combing through these these contracts? Yeah, for me, a big one is the mental health limitation. Uh, almost all insurance companies will place a mental health limitation in an insurance policy, which essentially limits payment of disabilities because of mental health related conditions to 24 months. And I can see why, right? Mental health claims are so inherently subjective. Insurance companies do not want to be, be beholden to paying claims for 5, 10, 15, 20 years on, on the subjective um, uh, claims of the insured. Um, but mental health is real. We all know that, right? And, 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 and the stress that uh, physicians have more today than any other time, it, it, it can put a real toll on individuals. I have represented many, many clients who have unfortunately suffered mental health conditions and needed to take a step back. Don't want to have a, a nasty surprise after 24 months that, hey, we paid the claim, you're done. And so you could go back and get an insurance policy insurance company rather, to remove a mental health limitation so that if you have a mental health condition that isn't going to resolve within 24 months, at least you can rest assured that you're going to continue to receive that income that you need. If we do experience an injury, how do we know if we're going to need someone like you? Like at what point do we reach out and contact an attorney that can help advocate for us? My preference naturally as a disability insurance attorney is call me early. I speak to some potential clients and I'll say, listen, I don't think you need me right now. Your claim sounds pretty cut and dry. Submit the claim, send me the claim form, send me your physician statements. I'll take a look at it. If anything jumps out, I'll let you know. But to be honest, your claim is going to get approved. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward. Most claims aren't like that, right? Most claims involve some nuanced scenario where Again, I go back to the surgeon who is not able to perform surgeries, but is now transitioning to the clinical side of the practice. Still working, still making income. Is he or she totally disabled? Is he or she partially disabled? This is all going to boil down to the nature of the occupation, how it was performed by the individual, the specific language in, in the insurance um, contract, how much income they continue to earn. Is that relevant or not? So there's so many moving parts in a disability insurance claim if you continue to work. And, and most physicians, I can't recall representing a client who had the ability to continue doing some work that didn't want to continue doing some work. It's, I think it's how we're built as professionals, right? So contrast the simple claim, not working at all, pretty straightforward with the more nuanced situation of you are working, but in what capacity and how has your occupation changed and where do you fit in the disability insurance policy? Are there certain types of claims that, that end up more often in litigation? I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is this like this gray zone where you're able to work somewhat. Like if you're not able to work at all, it's going to be hard for the insurance company to claim that they don't need to replace, you know, whatever you've agreed upon in the contract of your, or your income. But it's this, it's this, any, any of this gray zone is really where it ends up in litigation, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think the best way to illustrate my point is to briefly talk about a case I won last year in Illinois federal court. I represented a liver transplant surgeon who had an injury, couldn't perform liver transplants anymore. That was not disputed. The insurance company's doctor took a look at him, examined him and agreed. He cannot, should not perform liver transplants. That medical issue was settled. The question was on the occupation side. We took the position that the insurance contract ensured a medical specialty of a liver transplant surgeon. The insurance company took a different position and said, yeah, that's what the insurance contract says, but your occupation is really three occupations rolled into one. Namely, you're a liver transplant surgeon, you are a general liver surgeon and you're a professor because he worked at um, a university hospital. So you have three occupations, the insurance company argued, and you're only disabled from one. So now you're partially disabled, not totally. Our position again was that's not how you define uh, a liver transplant surgeon's occupation. 
right? The single most important duty of a liver transplant surgeon is to perform surgery. And we did a deep dive in the research on the case law. We found case law to support, support the proposition that essentially if there is one indispensable duty that you can't perform that had defined that occupation and you can't do it anymore, you are totally disabled from that occupation. So that gives you an example of type of cases that become, you can understand, you could see, you could argue both sides of that case, right? You, you, you could see where an attorney could, with a straight face, argue either side of that case. Boils down to at the end of the day, Brad, what is the language in the insurance policy? That's most important. It's possible that some individuals, after receiving their disability claim, if they're able to continue working in a different capacity, might end up with more income? It's a fact-specific scenario. Yeah. It can happen. Okay. I have had clients who've ended up with less income, and I've had clients who, without getting into attorney-client information, I've represented an emergency room physician who transitioned into an entirely different occupation in the medical field making significantly less income. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on the nuance of the disability, right? Like in my field, if I can't go to the operating room anymore and I can still do things in the office, if I can't go to the operating room, then there's probably a lot that I can't do in the office that I'm currently doing just because of the similar dexterity needs. But there's just a lot of gray zone in there. A lot of gray zone. And it sounds like no matter what, if we find ourselves there, we should definitely consult um Someone with your expertise. Yeah, I, at a minimum, I'll, I'll give guidance through that process. Um, I, I also have been doing this so long. I do work with the insurance companies, right? I mean, it's not all at war the minute Eddie Dapp who gets involved, right? It, it, it gets to that point when we're in litigation. That's a different piece. But the claims review process, we, we work with the insurance carriers to get them the information they truly need to do an honest and fair review to work, right? We work together to get these, they're insured, approved, and our client approved. So I like to tell insurance companies, we are working together for the same person, the person you insure and the person that I represent. And I'm here to facilitate that process. That's like saying a health insurance company's job is to keep us healthy, but <laughs> a health insurance company's job is to collect our premiums and, you know, I'm not so sure. But at the same time, you do work with insurance brokers, right? So this show has been has been sponsored by some insurance brokers. And what we talked about with the sh in the sh before the show is that you often end up working with them. Tell me about that relationship. Yeah. So I get calls from insurance brokers around the country uh, because the funny thing is, a physician tends to call their insurance broker before they call an attorney when they need to submit a disability claim. And sometimes the brokers will give them guidance on what to do, but they don't really want to get involved because they're selling insurance, right? And so they don't want to turn around and help somebody on the claim side. They may not like how it's perceived to the insurance company. But often the insurance brokers will call me and make an introduction and hand off their clients to me to become a client of mine. That makes sense. Like, who's the first person I'm going to call if I don't know you and I've never heard of you? I'm going to call the person that sold me the policy. I just got hurt. What do I do? So exactly. that connection makes sense. That, that introduction makes a lot of sense. So before the show, we had talked about the fact that there are different types of disability claims. What are the different types of claims? Broadly speaking, you have two potential types of claims. You have someone who is totally disabled or you have someone who's partially disabled. And that's where most of the dogfights come in on, on, on disability insurance claims involving physicians. Because total disability doesn't mean a state of absolute helplessness. It doesn't mean you can't practice at all. It goes back to the definition of total disability. And these insurance contracts are written in a way where total disability means that if you can't perform your occupation, in the way you were performing it, if it is, it, you know, there's an invisible line, an invisible threshold that you can cross over to become from partially to totally disabled. And it really just kind of always boils down to what that occupation looks like. How much of your occupation was gutted such that you are no totally disabled, even if you are showing up to the office two days a week. And, and sometimes what I see is claims start off as residually disabled. And the physician continues working, but over time, they stop getting patients 
referred or coming in to see them because people start to hear, well, Dr. XYZ can't perform these surgeries anymore. So those potential patients are being referred out to other surgeons and your practice dries up. So that can morph in a residual or partial disability claim can morph in to a total disability claim. Well, so then what happens then? Like, let's say if the case is settled, the case is settled, right? Or if like, it seemed like you were still earning income on the outpatient, you know, office hours side, and then that dries up, can you then appeal later on? Like, look what happened to my practice? Or once the case is over, the case is over. Great question. And that's, that speaks to the nature of disability insurance contracts. They're monthly indemnity contracts, which basically means you have to prove every month that you are disabled totally or partially before you get a check. So there is a, even after a claim is approved, there is a constant communication between me and the insurance companies on behalf of my clients. I don't just step out of the picture because there are going to be ongoing medical reviews, ongoing vocational reviews, constant check-ins by the insurance companies, up, updated information constantly has to be changed. So if my client's situation deteriorates on the medical side or on the occupation side, I will be communicating that information to the insurance carrier. And I have often written to insurance companies explaining that my client's partial disability claim has just transitioned into total. And we work then with those insurance companies to start paying total disability benefits. Got it. So you continue to be, if needed, you continue to be our advocate down the road. Correct. Depends on the type of situation, but yeah. Got it. It's not like this goes to court and is now settled and done. Like this is a continued relationship. It is. And I'll say that overwhelming majority of my cases do not end up in court. Believe it or not, the majority of my firm's claims get paid. Oh, and they don't like settle out of court. It's like you advocate and then they get paid as the client had thought they should, not in some compromised kind of way. That's exactly correct. They get paid because their claims were approved and they're being paid every month in accordance with the contract. Interesting. Now, once approved, not always approved. Th those approved claims could end up being um, terminated one year down the road, yeah. two years down the road. I've had clients that were paid for 10 years and then the insurance company terminated their benefits. So most do get approved and paid, but you still have to keep an eye on it. You still have to abide by the terms of the insurance policy, provide updated medical information, see your doctors, do all the things necessary to keep those benefits coming in. Is there ever like a disincentive to make an earnest attempt at going back to work? You know what I mean? Like, is does this then, you know, like workman's comp, sometimes it gets clouded. Like sometimes this, you know, there's like an incentive there to, or rather a disincentive to work. Does that end up happening here? I'm sure it happens. Uh, I think human beings are just, you know, everybody acts in their own best interest, right? right? So if you work hard as a, a with a surgical practice and now you're 60 years old and you have a disability and maybe you have five more years left of payment. Are you really going to, after two years, you know, try to find a way to go back to practicing yeah. at age 62? Probably not. But I can't really recall a client who was a physician specifically that would not return to work if they couldn't. I, again, I, I think professionals and in particular surgeons are just built differently hardwired differently. They make difficult clients though, right? I mean, they, they are not <laughs> clients. No, it makes sense, right? It's like, one, it's wrapped up in our identity. So I would argue there's even some pathology there that ends up making, partially defining us. But there's a reason that we went into this profession to begin with, like whether it's a calling or not, it's we're just like driven people. And, you know, we try to do whatever we can to claw back tooth and nail to get back where we were. I think it's how we're built and how we ended up. Is there anything else that you want to tell us when we're, before we sign a disability contract, right? Anything else that you, we haven't talked about yet that you think we should be, we should make sure is in there or just, you know, hammer a point home that you've already made? Yeah. So I'll tell you, when you have an opportunity to purchase disability insurance, you want to first and foremost, make sure it's a true own occupation. 
as we discussed earlier, it should not have other language in there that says you cannot be engaged in any other work because you're going to want to find something else to do, it's, especially if disability strikes when you're young. You never know. The second thing is watch out for the two-year mental health limitation that we had discussed. If you can get that out, you should. Third, make sure the definition of own occupation lasts throughout the entire benefit payment period in the insurance policy, which could be up through age 65 or sometimes life. More recently, some of these insurance policies being sold to physicians have a five-year limit for own occupation. And, and after five years, you then have to be disabled from any gainful work. That's a much higher standard to meet. So look for that as well. Wow. I think given inflation today, it would be wise to get an insurance policy that has a cost of living adjustment on that benefit. Yeah. That's a one. I've seen cases where over a period of 20 odd years, it really changes the benefit payment. Yeah. And you're going to want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're like those two things, right? If you're disabled soon after you finish training, right? If you're like 35, 40 and you're, and you're, you've got ended up with a permanent injury, right? To spend the next 20, 25 years, if they're only replacing it for five years, right? Now you're 45 and you're not getting any claims anymore or inflation, right? Like you're expecting to get 20, 25 years of claims and what it was worth 25 years before can be dramatically different. So yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and think of what your alternative is if you can't work. It's social security disability from the government. And that's capped at about 3000 something dollars a month. Yeah. If you had a pretty decent income and that's all taken away, what's your fallback? So, you know, you really want to make sure you're properly insured. No, you, we were talking about this earlier. Nobody buys disability insurance with the intent of using it, right? When you're coming out of medical school or you're in residence, you're not stacking up on disability insurance to say, yay, I'm going to use this one day. You just don't. But you never know. It's like buying life insurance with the expectation to use it, right? Like nobody's hoping for that. And then final thoughts on if we do have an injury, right? And we expect to apply for using our disability insurance because of that injury. Anything else that you want to close with? Yeah. Here's the biggest no-no I see with my clients. There's an injury. There's a sickness. It's impacting your practice. You're struggling. You're waking up every day. You're trying to figure out, how do I keep this going? All right. So now you stop. You stop performing the most rigorous, the longest procedures, right? Maybe it was also the procedure that you earned the most income from. Fine. Do that for three months. But your condition continues to progress. So you cut back on something else. Six more months, you cut back on something else. All this time, you haven't notified the insurance company that you have a potential disability. You call Eddie Dapdu two years later, and I say, great, let's look at your case. Say, Doc, what you're doing now in your office is a radically different occupation than it was when you first got injured two years ago. You should have contacted me two years ago. And now you've got a complicated mess I have to clean up. And so the timeline on that disability becomes very murky. And it's hard to reconstruct the, those disability claims. Even if I backdate the disability two years, am I going to have all the CPT codes in place to show it? Am I going to be able to tie the, the, the loss of income over the two years to your injury? Call me early. We're going to have a discussion about it. And We'll, we'll figure it out moving forward, but it, it's, it's much easier for me to get involved earlier, even if I'm just giving you advice on what it could look like down the road, rather than bringing me in two years after the fact when a lot has changed in your career. That makes a lot of sense because I think almost every physician I know would do exactly that. Because that's what we do. We push through. We were trained to push through. So what do you do? Scale back a little bit, work through the pain scale back a little bit, work through the pain, because that's just how we're geared. So that is amazing advice. Okay. Well, Eddie Dabdub, thank you so much for advocating for physicians. If people want to, if someone wants to get in touch with you, how do we do that? Hopefully they don't need to, but if they do, how do we get in touch with you? Easy to find me online, longtermdisability.net. Eddie Dabdub of longtermdisability.net. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, Brad. Nice chatting with you. Before we go, 
Be sure to check out the incredible work of Edward Dabdab and Dabdab Law Firm. For more information and expert guidance on disability insurance claims, visit their website, longtermdisability.net. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.